Hello, welcome. Um, I have the, um, I'm Jennifer Bard. It's my honor and pleasure to be dean of this law school, uh, which comes with some really great perks. And one of them has been spending a few days with um, a man I admire greatly and have since I practiced law in New York City a couple of years ago, um, Judge Rakoff. <laughs> So I, my job is I will tell you a little about the judge in residence program, very little, and then Professor Moore will introduce uh, Judge Rakoff to you. Um, the judge in residence program, and I think not everybody um, is as familiar with this program, started in the early 1980s, and it was a memorial in honor of UC Law alumnus uh, Smith Tyler Jr., and he was one of Cincinnati's leading trial lawyers. There, there are stories to be told, which we can talk about later. This tribute, though, was the brainchild of, of the late U.S. District Judge Carl B. Rubin and attorney Lawrence A. K. Jr., who had been partners with Mr. Tyler, and their law firm was Tyler, Kane and Rubin. So the program started, and as explained to me, it started with having trials in the law school, but every time a trial got set, they all settled. No one wanted to try a case in the law school. So there had to be sort of a shift in direction. And uh, leaping a little ahead, in 2005, our own Professor Bettman, who I've lost track of over there, um, took over. And she herself, it, as I, almost everyone knows, is a former appellate judge. And what you may not know is that her husband, the late Judge uh, Gilbert Bettman, was also a judge in residence here. So she took over, and it really took the shape that it has today. Um, and the shape we have today is a st distinguished jurist spends three days here at the law school, and Judge Rakoff has. I mean, show of hands, who, who has been in a setting with Judge Rakoff over the last three days? Okay. Very, this is a, and this is an amazing opportunity. So Judge Rakoff's been visiting classes, he's had, uh, he's had coffee hours, he's had dinners, he's, he's spent wonderful time with us. And um, I know everyone's enjoyed it. He has a standing invitation to come back and the possible um, inducement of a tour of the Graders plant, which I'm working on. <laughs> um, so with Professor Bettman's retirement this year, the program is now under the very skilled and able hands of Professor Michelle Bradley, who has made all these parts move. So I just wanted to take a second and thank Professor Bradley for <laughs> Really amazing, and I won't take time here, but I am going to send something out. I would imagine that you would you would know how much administrative support it takes to do an event like that, and all the 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 people that you know in the front office, um, uh, Mrs. Hayes, Mrs. Del Vecchio, everyone, um, and really most of our faculty and staff have have really been anticipating this and planning a long time. So it, it's been a wonderful visit. Um, and we're very glad that it's that to have it. So your materials list, who has been the judges in residence before, and that's up on the web. Um, and I'd like you to look, because it is a remarkable group of 24 different uh, judges from all over the country, circuit judges, uh, Supreme Court uh, judges from a wide variety of states. So again, thank you to Judge Rakoff, Professor Bettman, Professor Bradley, um, and to all the sponsors of this event, um, some of whom are here today, but some of them uh, couldn't make it, and they too, um, names are listed in the web. We really appreciate it. Um, this has been a wonderful enhancement for all of us uh, in the life of the law school. So thank you. It is an enormous pleasure and honor to introduce to you this Renaissance man with whose uh, presence we've been graced the past few days. You may or may not know Judge Rakoff as a recent Forbes Top 50 World's Greatest Leaders, one of those. He's been banned from Russia by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs there. Ask him about that. He's an expert on the ideological and practical implica implications of growing a beard. And he is, in addition to his authorship of innumerable articles, essays, and judicial opinions, he is a poet, a songwriter, and a ballroom dancer renowned for his appearances in Top Hat and Tales. So this adventure began in Germantown, Philadelphia, the Ger Germantown section of Philly, uh, uh, stints at Swarthmore for his Bachelor of Arts at Oxford, and then at Harvard for his JD, where he uh, claims to have served and served well on the legal, with the Legal Aid Bureau there. 
he spent two years doing civil litigation with a large New York firm and then saw the light and turned to criminal law. He became a uh, federal prosecutor, spent seven years at that hitch, and then he truly got the word and became a defense lawyer specializing in white collar and RICO, uh, civil RICO defense. Uh, President Clinton appointed him to the Southern District of New York, the federal trial bench there, uh, where he has served with extraordinary distinction. He is an adjunct at Columbia, uh, as if he were not busy enough, teaching white collar crime and science in the courts, among other courses, while continuing maintaining a dizzying number of leadership roles, which include uh, service on the MacArthur Foundation's Law and Neuroscience Project, he chairs the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Eyewitness Identification, member of the National Commission on Forensic Science. I understand that to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, a follow-up to the National Academy of Science study that ripped into the low quality of forensic science across this country, particularly in criminal cases. And he became my own personal hero when he resigned from that commission, when he got into a tussle with the prosecutorial leadership that at that point, refused to expand, expand, include in the mission of the commission, discovery reform. It's a shock to many people to realize that one has rights to broader discovery in a civil case where money is at issue than in a criminal case where one's liberty is at issue. And Judge Rakoff took on that tussle. I sent him a copy of my Brooklyn article on criminal discovery reform, along with a model reform bill that I helped to draft as a leader of a national task force on criminal discovery reform. And I'm perfectly confident that none of that had anything to do with the prosecutor backing down in that instance and Judge Rakoff rejoining the commission. So we welcome Judge Rakoff. Please join me in doing so to hear his comments on the limitations on forensic evidence, eyewitness identification testimony in criminal prosecutions. So I, I uh, want to uh, thank Professor Moore for that really uh, very gracious introduction. Uh, I am particularly pleased that my wife is not here because she would demand rebuttal time. <laughs> um, the, I've had a terrific uh, time here the last uh, three days. Um, uh, I've been uh, to nine classes. I've gotten to meet uh, so many of you. Uh, I said to the dean last night that uh, I thought, having gone to all those classes, uh, I should uh, be qualified now for a JD degree from your uh, uh, law school, she said, we have to wait on the grades. Uh, uh, so um, uh, before I get into the subject, I do need to uh, make a disclaimer required by law. Uh, under um, uh, federal law, I am uh, prohibited uh, from speaking about any pending case, not just pending before me, but pending before any uh, judge anywhere. Uh, and I'm also prohibited from talking about any issue that may come before me for decision in the foreseeable future. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought that's really pretty darn broad. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not. Um, so. Uh, I want to start off with a quote, and I, I wrote it down to make sure I got it right. Uh, this is from one of the most famous judges ever to serve on the federal bench, uh, Learned Han. And in 1923, he said, in a, as part of a uh, decision, quote, our procedure has always been haunted by the ghost of the innocent man convicted. It is an unreal dream, close quote. And that was the attitude that uh, I think not only most judges, but most people had uh, for uh, decades, uh, maybe centuries. I know that when I was a federal prosecutor, I thought there's no way uh, an innocent man will ever be convicted in this country. We have proof beyond a reasonable doubt. We have um, uh, the requirement that a jury of 12 people be unanimous. Um, uh, some guilty people may get off, but 
uh, never will an innocent man uh, be convicted. And uh, when I became a defense lawyer, I began to mm, maybe worry about that a little bit, but I said to myself, no, 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 it must be, you know, I'm now on the defense side, I'm probably too biased uh, towards uh, my clients. Uh, my clients, of course, uh, all told me they were innocent. Um, that's when I increased my fee. Um, the, the, uh, so um, uh, I, I just was quite convinced, as most judges were convinced, uh, that uh, the innocent person would be protected by our system. And along came the Innocence Project, uh, which uh, this law school should be so proud of because so many of you have been uh, involved either as students or professors or as graduates uh, in that magnificent uh, work. And the Innocent Project very quickly established that our system is not a In fact, uh, we convict innocent people with some degree of regularity. Uh, the Innocence Project uh, only dealt with the most serious crimes, uh, and rape, and yet uh, using DNA, uh, it has now established the factual innocence of, of well over 330 uh, people, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a uh, uh, broader blog put together by the University of Michigan, uh, University of Michigan, um, which keeps track of exonerations that are proven in court, where the exoneration is based on factual innocence, and it's now up to well over a thousand. Um, so, what's going on here, and why is this happening? Well, the Innocence Project also keeps track of what are the factors that are most common uh, in the. Uh, faulty conviction. Um, and the second most common is faulty forensic science. We'll get to what the first is in a few minutes, but the second, in over 50% of the exoneration cases uh, tracked by the Innocence Project, uh, uh, there was faulty forensic science. Now, what do I mean by forensic science? Well, I'm going to exclude DNA because although DNA is a form of forensic science in a way, uh, it was put together by scientists for scientific purposes and only then got used in the criminal justice system. Uh, most forensic science was developed by non-scientists, was developed uh, by law enforcement agencies uh, for law enforcement purposes. For example, fingerprinting was uh, first developed by Scotland Yard uh, in the very late 19th century. Um, and uh, other familiar tools, the so-called CSI type uh, stuff, um, bite marks, um, uh, hair uh, samples, uh, all the various kinds of things that come in as forensic science. Uh, were never developed by scientists. They were developed by the uh, law enforcement community for its purposes. And that really probably was the start of the problem uh, because uh, it turns out that uh, much of this stuff doesn't meet uh, basic scientific validity uh, principles. Uh, this became, began to... Uh, dawn on the courts uh, as a result of the work of the Innocence Project, uh, but it became more evident as the result of the uh, 1993 decision of the Supreme Court in the Daubert case. Now, uh, many of you may think that's the Daubert case. It's spelled D-A-U-B-E-R-T. Uh, most people, including most judges, pronounce it Daubert. Uh, a few snobs pronounce it Dober. Um, <laughs> But it is, in fact, Mr. Mr. Daubert pronounces it Daubert, and he should know. Um, so uh, I will call it the Daubert case. But the Daubert case said the judges had a gatekeeping function when it came to scientific uh, evidence, and that basically the evidence should meet uh, at least most of four criteria uh, that were set forth by the court. Uh, the first was... Uh, that uh, the methodology had to be 
uh, testable and tested. Uh, second, it had to be uh, subject to peer review, usually in the form of publication in reputable scientific journals. Uh, third, it had to have uh, an acceptable error rate, um, at, not too great an error rate in other words. Um, and fourth, uh, it had to be generally accepted in the scientific community. Most forensic science does not meet any of those None. Most of it has never been meaningfully tested by scientists. Most of it has never been peer reviewed uh, in scientific journals. Most of it has uh, never been accepted by the uh, scientific community as opposed to the forensic science uh, scientific community, uh, which is essentially a law enforcement and quasi-law enforcement community. Uh, and uh, most of the methodologies used uh, have error rates that either are unknown or are huge. Um, so it began to uh, dawn on um, judges as we began to apply this uh, that maybe this stuff was really problematic. Now for a long time there were only a few Dauber challenges in criminal cases uh, for something that you and I will all appreciate uh, uh, lawyers are not uh, very good at science. Uh, I was an English major um, <laughs> They, uh, you, a lot of you were probably poli-sci majors or history majors. Uh, uh, we all took that what one required course, uh, astronomy or uh, <laughs> the, uh, so, uh, you know, we shy away from this and defense lawyers were really not well equipped. But over time, uh, that's begun to uh, change. Um, the, um, I had a case uh, uh, about 10 years ago where such a challenge was uh, raised to um, toolmark evidence. Uh, the theory of toolmark evidence is that every time you fire uh, a bullet, uh, it, there are certain unique uh, markings that are left both on the bullet and on the shell uh, uh, and on the uh, barrel, the inner, inner part of the barrel of the gun never been validated, that's a, just a hypothesis, uh, but many people have gone to prison on the basis of uh, the toolmark uh, expert saying, yes, it's a match. And I asked the expert in the case uh, I had, uh, who was the uh, number one toolmark expert for New York City Police Department, what's your error rate? And he said, zero. I said, that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> what's how did you determine that it was zero? And he said, well, I've never testified using this methodology in any case in which the defendant wasn't convicted. Uh, <laughs> perhaps not the most scientific way of assessing error rate. Um, the, uh, uh, there was a much more um, dramatic example of the problems with forensic science uh, in 2004, in uh, a case that arose out of the Madrid bombing, um, the, uh, some of you uh, uh, may know that in 2004, there was a terrorist bombing of passenger trains in Madrid. Many people were killed. And the Spanish police found a plastic bag on which there were some detonator caps in the bag that had not been used, but they hypothesized were available uh, to be used during the bombing. And there was a couple of smudged fingerprints on that bag. And uh, they sent those, thanks to computers, they were able to send uh, copies of that fingerprint worldwide to the various banks that different countries maintain of fingerprints. Uh, and the FBI announced that they had found a match. Uh, and the match was a fellow named uh, Brandon Mayfield, who was a uh, radical attorney uh, in Seattle. Um, and uh, three different FBI fingerprint experts. And the FBI uh, has, uh, by all accounts, the best fingerprint 
uh, laboratory uh, in the United States, and these were their top experts, they all announced that it was their opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty that the print on the bag was uh, belonged and matched uh, the known prints of uh, Brandon Mayfield. And based on that evidence, uh, Mayfield was arrested. Um, the Spanish police were never convinced, among other things, there was no uh, evidence that Mr. Mayfield had been in Spain during the relevant uh, period. Um, and they continued their investigation. And fortunately, not too much long, long after Mr. Mayfield's arrest, uh, they found the person who turned out to be the culprit. And they sent his fingerprints to the FBI. And the FBI said, mm, sorry about that. You're right. Uh, this is a much better match uh, than Mr. Mayfield's prints. Um, but, you know, but for that fortuity, uh, Mr. Mayfield might be in prison right now. Um, and uh, the reason that that mistake was made is that fingerprint analysis is not really scientific. It involves a very great degree of subjectivity, and that's true of forensic science generally. Um, the, uh, nevertheless, uh, most of my colleagues, uh, most judges generally, continued to admit fingerprint uh, evidence over challenges. Uh, I'm sorry to say that's true even today. Uh, but that began to at least get undermined uh, further uh, in 2009 when the National Academy of Science uh, issued its report on forensic science that Professor Moore referred to. Uh, and uh, it was devastating. Uh, they concluded um, overall that forensic science, and they went through each of the major forensic sciences, that forensic science is, uh, quote, a subjective, untested procedure that purports to be infallible. Um, and that's the two-edged sword, the two significant problems with forensic science. It involves a considerable degree of subjectivity and yet it masquerades as hard, infallible science and thus pulls the wool over the eyes of too many jurors. Um, so National Academy of Science said that the solution to this, they made many recommendations, but probably their uh, largest recommendation was to create a national standard setting um, body, an independent uh, body drawn from the uh, hard science community that would set standards for testing, standards for determining uh, error rate, standards for methodology, standards for certification, and so on down the line. Uh, and if you didn't meet uh, those standards, um, you couldn't qualify as a forensic scientist and you couldn't go into court and ask to have your evidence it. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. It should happen. It would be a terrific thing. Um, but I at least am able to report some progress nevertheless. Uh, what, uh, what was done in response to the uh, National Academy report was uh, that the uh, Department of Justice set up a commission um, the uh, National Commission on Forensic Science uh, that um, I have the privilege of being one member of uh, because there ought to be a, a, you know, uh, at least one English major on a, a commission like this. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, mission has moved slowly but has made progress. Um, I did at one point um, feel the need to resign from that uh, commission, um, uh, and it was a major uh, uh, undertaking uh, because uh, my resignation lasted all of 24 hours. Um, but I, but uh, in all seriousness, the the I was lured back uh, by um, the 
Deputy Attorney General who uh, said, yes, the commission will take a broader uh, stance than it has and will examine th uh, uh, broader uh, applications of forensic science and broader pretrial disclosure of forensic science than was originally intended, and she has been true to her word. Uh, and what's going to come up in the next meeting of the National Academy of, uh, excuse me, a National Commission, which is a week from now, um, is uh, a proposal uh, to turn over to the uh, National uh, Institute uh, on Standards and Technology, which is a government agency called NIST, uh, much of what the National Academy of Science was recommending for an independent agency. Because it won't be an independent agency, it won't be as uh, perfect a solution as the National Academy of Science report contemplated, but I do think that if it's adopted by the commission, and of course that remains to be seen, the, the won't be considering this until next week and they consider it at two consecutive meetings. But if they do adopt that uh, recommendation, I think it will be a forward in curing at least some of the problems uh, with forensic science. Uh, and that leads me to what I think is the first problem and one not so obviously curable. I mentioned before that forensic science is the second leading cause of false convictions. What's the first leading cause? It is, according to the Innocence Project, false eyewitness identifications. Over 70% uh, of all um, uh, people who were falsely convicted and exonerated by uh, DNA uh, were uh, at trials where they were fingered erroneously as the person who had committed the crime. Um, and these were almost never perjurious witnesses. Uh, they, these were uh, typically bystanders. They had uh, no stake in the outcome. They had no motive to lie. Um, they uh, said they would take the stand and it would be incredibly powerful evidence, and it didn't have to go through any kind of um, um, sifting uh, under Daubert because it was lay testimony. Um, and they would say, I'll never forget that face. Um, you know, um, there is the culprit. Uh, that's my relative, John Isidore, so I know he's guilty. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, so uh, uh, very, very powerful evidence. Uh, and yet often erroneous. So the, the, the National Academy of Science set up a, another committee, uh, which I had the, the very great privilege of being the co-chair of, uh, to study from a scientific standpoint uh, why it is that you have these frequent eyewitness identification. Uh, uh, and the problem has two aspects, one of which is curable perhaps and the other which may not be curable. Um, the uncurable part are limitations uh, in the brain, and particularly in perception and memory. Um, for example, start with the obvious. If you're a bystander and you're witnessing a crime uh, with a stranger, uh, you, it's a period of great stress for you. Um, uh, you will often, if there's a weapon involved, be uh, riveted uh, uh, in your uh, vision on the weapon and only peripherally uh, perceiving uh, the face of the uh, perpetrator. Um, the, if you are white and the perpetrator is black, you will not be as good at perceiving features if, as you would be if he were white, and vice versa, by the way. Uh, if you are black and the perpetrator is white, uh, you will not be as good as you would be in uh, perceiving uh, the features of his face. Um, and your memory, even if you see uh, the perpetrator's face for uh, a good uh, two 
minutes, and that's often more than you will, um, uh, will begin to fade almost immediately, uh, often be materially reduced um, in your uh, ability to recall specific features uh, by uh, as little as three hours later. That's all built into the perception equipment, and it gets worse. Um, you, uh, if the police come to you as an eyewitness and you're asked to uh, uh, view a lineup, uh, which these days is usually not a human lineup, but a photo array, um, and uh, you pick out someone uh, who is, you believe is the perpetrator. By the time you get to testify a trial, maybe a year later, uh, without any conscious recognition on your part, your memory will have merged the very clear features that you identified in the photograph with a much more fuzzy memory that you actually had of the actual perpetrator. So that when you get on the stand, what you will think you're remembering is what you saw at the time of the crime, but what you will actually be remembering will be the photo you picked out at the time of the photo array. These are all things <coughs> that all the studies that we looked at in the committee suggest are fairly built into the human brain and are not likely to be able to be changed. Now there are <coughs> excuse me, there are other things that can be changed uh, and, um, and to some extent have been already. Um, the first and most obviously um, is the nature of the lineup. And 30, 40 years ago, the Supreme Court uh, said the lineup has to be one where all seven people, a typical lineup is seven people or seven photos, um, more or less have common features so that um, you're not pinpointing uh, one person is so clearly uh, different from the other six. Uh, this is a question of degree because if they're too much alike, uh, then there is, you increase the danger of a false identification because uh, uh, you may have the right guy, uh, but you have someone who looks so much like him and the, uh, and the uh, eyewitness picks the second person. Um, but uh, thanks to computers and thanks to photo arrays, uh, lineups today, the photo array lineups are really much, much better than they were in the human lineups uh, that had to be gathered sort of ad hoc uh, years ago. Uh, but there's another problem that uh, has still not been addressed in most jurisdictions. So who is the person who's showing you the photo array? It's typically a policeman who is working on the case. And he or she already has their own hunches as to whom the perpetrator uh, is. In fact, uh, while sometimes the photo array is shown uh, for the purposes of trying to figure out uh, what a lead would be, many, many times it's shown the policeman is already in his mind fairly confident it's Mr. X, but he wants validation. And in those circumstances, the police person will often give off body language uh, that suggests you should choose one person over the other, or if you've chosen the one that he likes, uh, that yes, you've got it right. Uh, good police people will never say, oh, you got it right, or anything like that. This is a more subtle thing, but there are many, many studies uh, that suggest that that body language has a real effect uh, in getting people to choose uh, a photo or to say how confident they are, and that's another thing um, the Supreme Court, uh, when it first addressed this issue, uh, said uh, that uh, in determining whether to admit um, the identification uh, made at uh, a photo array and the underlying identification uh, uh, evidence from the crime, 
uh, a big factor should be the confidence of the person uh, in her identification. But all the studies show two things. They show, number one, that the level of confidence initially expressed is largely a function of your personality. Um, there are people uh, who are timid and shy and uncertain, and even if in their mind they have a very clear image of the person, uh, they will often say, well, I'm, I'm just a little unsure. I, I think it's this person. There are other people. Uh, we can call them confident people or we can call them law students, whatever, uh, the, uh, who will say, it's him, I know it, uh, because that's their personality. They have great confidence in their judgment and their memory and their perceptions, but it has little to do with the image that actually is in their mind. What is true of both classes of people is that by the time they testify at trial, their confidence level will be expressed as higher than what they gave at the time they picked the guy out of the photo array. Um, and this is, again, built into the uh, personality. It, ha it's a, it has all sorts of psychological explanations that I won't uh, bother you with, but uh, it's been shown uh, uh, repeatedly that uh, everyone's confidence level will be expressed at a higher level uh, at when they testify uh, than when they um, to express their level of confidence at the photo array. Now, some of these things can be fixed, uh, and the National Academy of Science report that came out last year uh, said uh, the photo array or lineup um, should always be administered by a police person who is not involved in the investigation of the case. So, and knows nothing about it. So, uh, body language will not be a f factor. Um, and uh, secondly, that uh, the, the uh, identification procedure should always be videotaped. Um, so you can see if accidentally there's any kind of suggestibility going on. Um, and thirdly, that uh, the jury or judge uh, should be told what the confidence level was at the time of the uh, initial identification so that at least uh, the jury can discount the higher level of confidence that's now being uh, expressed at the uh, trial. And there are a bunch of other uh, recommendations uh, that we make. But here's the real problem. Like forensic science, where we can tighten up the methodology and turn it hopefully into good science. Unlike the factors in eyewitness identification uh, that are uh, a factor of police procedures where we can change and improve the procedures, big important factors that lead to false eyewitness identification are mind in the makeup of the human brain and that we can't change. So what are we going to do about that? Well, the report talks about two possible solutions. There is no perfect solution by any means. Um, one is to have jury instructions from the judge that will educate the jury uh, as to some of these problems with eyewitness identification. And this has now been done by two states, uh, New Jersey and Oregon. Um, but the very preliminary, and I want to stress the word preliminary, studies that have been done of the New Jersey juries that received these instructions was they disregarded eyewitness identification altogether. So they threw out the baby with the bathwater. They said, oh my gosh, now that we know all these things that could go wrong with eyewitness identification, we will give it no weight whatsoever. Now that may be a reaction. There are certainly cases where uh, everything about the identification suggests that it is reliable. Um, mission says that that's, um, th those instructions are better than nothing, 
What we would prefer to see is have uh, experts testify. Uh, told this to one of my colleagues. Uh, the first words out of his mouth was, oh no, not another expert. But uh, to have uh, experts testify for both sides who would be much more pinpointed. They would just talk about the aspects of this particular case that might or might not have influenced a faulty eyewitness identification, and maybe something about the, uh, what was known about the uh, person making the identification and their uh, memory capacities and perception capacities and things like that. Um, and this so-called framework testimony, which could be the subject of cross-examination, uh, would give a jury a sense of why eyewitness identification can often be inaccurate, but not always, and why, and some of the things they ought to look at uh, in making their determination as to whether the eyewitness is accurate or inaccurate. But I am frank to say that I and the committee all felt that this, either, the, either of these solutions is a halfway solution. Uh, the fundamental problem here with eyewitness identification that is hardwired into the brain and that cannot easily be cured. Um, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to end on a fairly um, pessimistic note in that one regard. I come back to Learned Hand's uh, statement that convicting uh, uh, the innocent is an unreal dream and I unfortunately have to report that it's an all too true nightmare come true. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'd be very uh, happy to take any questions or, or comments. I think we have a few minutes for that. Yes. I'm sorry? Do you have a better? Ah, uh, dogs. Okay. <laughs> they, they, uh, I thought you were referring to some of my cases. Uh, <laughs> they, they, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, I don't know enough about that. Uh, I know that there have been even Supreme Court cases now uh, dealing with that. Uh, that was not something that either uh, the National Academy of Science or the uh, or the committee that I was uh, part of de de dealt with in any um, meaningful degree. Uh, but the, the problem always has to be, um, where is the scientific validation? Um, it's one thing to train a dog that they can smell cocaine or whatever, uh, and they may be right 50% uh, uh, of the time, or they may be right 90% of the time, and unless you've had serious studies, uh, to validate the results, uh, this is all going to be hocus pocus. Uh, I've, uh, I, I want to mention in passing I, 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 the um, what I think is the single worst forensic science, and it's not admitted in the courts, but it's used hugely by law enforcement uh, uh, and uh, as well as parts of the judiciary, and that is the polygraph, the so-called. Uh, eye detector, um, and um, with apologies, I, I really meant to mention this before, so I'll take uh, a couple of minutes and tell you uh, about the polygraph, because that was also the subject of another National Academy uh, report, uh, which found that no one knows uh, whether the polygraph is valid or not, but from even what little we do know, we know that its error rate is as much as 35%. Uh, the polygraph um, uh, starts on the assumption that if you're lying, your pulse rate um, uh, uh, will increase, you will start to sweat, uh, and so forth, just like in the movies. Uh, but um, the, um, uh, of course, the same thing will happen if you're nervous taking a polygraph test. Um, so there's a sort of built-in problem in, in the whole theory. Um, I had the, and I apologize for, for this long 
discretion, I had the following experience in my own court. Because polygraphs are not allowed in court, but law enforcement uses them all. So after 9-11, um, there, there's a hotel, the Millennium Hotel, which is right there at Ground Zero. And on 9-11, um, all the uh, guests had to, of course, evacuate the hotel, leaving all their goods behind. And the um, uh, about three months after that, uh, the FBI allowed uh, a security guard from uh, several security guards from the hotel to go back into the hotel to retrieve the belongings of the guests so they could be returned. And one of those security guards uh, reported to the FBI that he had found on the uh, in a 50th floor, this is a 51 story um, hotel, so it's rather small by New York standards, but um, the, he had found on the uh, 50th floor in a room uh, a copy of the Koran and a pilot's radio. What's a pilot's radio? It's a device that can be used from the ground to help direct planes when they have to be very uh, precise. It's used, for example, on aircraft carriers. Uh, and uh, the uh, FBI began to wonder whether the person who had been in that room might have been an accomplice to the terrorists who bombed the, who crashed into the uh, Twin Towers and had helped direct them to that. And uh, the guests who, the security guard reported that the guest who had been in that room was a fellow named Abdullah Higazi. And when the FBI began looking into his background, they found that he was a former member of the Egyptian Air Force who was purportedly in the United States as a uh, student at Brooklyn College. And they wonder, well, what's he doing in the hotel if he's supposed to be uh, at Brooklyn College? Uh, but he was still around. He was still a student at Brooklyn College. So they went out and interviewed him. <laughs> And he had a pretty good explanation for why he'd been in the hotel and for various other things. But when they said, well, why did you have the pilot's radio? He said, I didn't have any pilot's radio. What are you talking about? And the FBI thought, well, yeah, the security guard had no motive to, to make this up, so he must be lying. Um, so we want to at least freeze him in his testimony. So they brought him before me um, after our counsel was appointed to represent him. Uh, and asked that he be detained under a material witness warrant. I was somewhat skeptical of uh, what they were telling me, but I agreed that he could be detained for uh, three days, but no more. Um, the, uh, uh, while he was in my courtroom, Mr. Hagassi, who spoke, spoke perfect English, said, um, I want a polygraph test. I want a lie detector test because <coughs> I'm telling the truth, it was not my pilot's radio. And I explained to him that polygraphs are very unreliable and um, therefore um, they're not admissible in federal court. Um, and, but when, when he was uh, let out of the courtroom, he said to his lawyer, well, don't the FBI, doesn't the FBI use polygraphs? And the uh, uh, lawyer correctly said, oh yes, they use them all the time. Um, so he said, well, why don't we have the FBI do a polygraph and then they'll, be, they'll know it's not my pilot's radio um, and I can get out of here. So the next day, the uh, FBI brought up from Washington their number one polygrapher um, and he and Mr. Hagazi went into a room. The attorney was not allowed to be in the room because as the FBI polygrapher announced, the machine is so delicate that even having someone in the room could affect the results. Um, but he was allowed to be outside and the FBI agent said that uh, any time uh, Mr. Hagazi wanted to talk to his lawyer, he could of course stop the music and go talk to his lawyer. So Mr. Hagazi was then questioned for three hours. Every time he was asked about the pilot's radio uh, and uh, said it was not my radio. Um, the uh, FBI agent reported, the machine shows you're lying. Um, and he began getting ever more frazzled, 
Uh, I s imagine he had visions of being locked up uh, forever. Um, and finally, after three hours, um, he said, well, maybe it was by radio. At that point, the FBI agent stopped the music, went out to the attorney, said, your client has confessed to lying. I suggest we explore cooperation. We think he knows a lot more about what was going on with 9-11. The attorney, to his great credit, said, get lost, and we're ending the procedure right now. The FBI then brought the Mr. Hagazi back before me, this time with a criminal complaint, charging him with lying to the FBI uh, when he had said it was not his pilot's radio and saying in the complaint he has now in effect admitted that it was his radio. Um, and that case uh, would have gone on the normal track. Uh, he was detained on the basis of that complaint. Um, and I could see from things that the assistant U.S. attorney was saying to me that they were now totally convinced that he was part of the 9-11 conspiracy and they were going to try to build uh, a uh, case against him for terrorism that would have been a capital case uh, carrying the death penalty. Um, three days later, American Airlines pilot uh, called up uh, the security people at the Millennium Hotel and said, thank you for mailing me my clothes, uh, but what about my pilot's radio? Um, and the whole thing then uh, completely unraveled, um, and it turned out that it was the American Airlines pilot who had, for perfectly legitimate reasons, the pilot's radio in his room and a totally different floor, um, and that the security guard had been so outraged by 9-11 uh, that he had decided that any Muslim uh, must be a terrorist and so he had made this whole thing up um, in order to get this guy uh, locked up. Um, the government of course dropped the charges against Higazi, pr successfully prosecuted the security guard. Uh, Mr. Higazi uh, got um, a big settlement from the government um, uh, but uh, it couldn't, I couldn't help but wonder, but for the fortuity that that American Airlines pilot had come forward, you know, what might have happened uh, to Mr. Hagazi. Um, so I ordered uh, an investigation of the, uh, one thing that was unclear to me was whether the um, polygraph results um, were real, that is to say, whether the FBI agent was saying you lied because the polygraph showed that the guy lied, or whether the FBI agent was just saying that in order to induce what he thought was a confession. And law enforcement uses both those techniques all the time. So I ordered an investigation. The government uh, argued with some force that I had no power to order an investigation. Um, I said, take it up to the Court of Appeals. Uh, <laughs> But they finally caved uh, and did do an investigation, and their investigation showed that the polygraph machine had recorded that he was lying. And my whole point of this very long-winded story, uh, this dismal and tragic story, um, is that uh, the, the, the huge motivation for pushing this forward uh, and what led to this dire set of circumstances was the inherently flawed thing we call the polygraph. Uh, I have no doubt in my own mind from what I learned about the polygraph that it was because when he was asked the key question, which he knew was the key question, uh, is this your pilot's radio, he got nervous. And so his pulse rate went up, his, he began to sweat, all the things that the polygraph people say, oh, that's a sign of lying. Long-winded story. Uh, I'll teach you to ask a question. Uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, it's another uh, example of really terrible forensic science in this country. Are there any, does anyone else want to dare ask a question? <laughs> yes, ma'am. We did not. Uh, the question is, what about false confessions? But I'll tell you uh, the little I know about that. Start again with the Innocence Project. Uh, uh, the, of the uh, more than 335 people who have been 
exonerated by the Innocence Project, 10% of them pled guilty to the crimes that definitively we know they never committed. So uh, uh, now that probably overstates the uh, amount of false confessions because there they were facing the death penalty and they had uh, a real motive to try to escape it by pleading to something less. Um, there are estimates, none of which I think are reliable, that puts the number of false confessions at somewhere, some, some studies say 2%, some studies say 8%. Um, but even if it were just 1%, we're talking in an era of mass incarceration with 2.2 million people in prison, we are talking 20,000 people uh, who falsely confessed are in, and are in prison as a result of a false confession. Why does someone falsely confess to a crime? Well, I think the, you don't need to be a scientist to know that. Um, the, we have a system of justice where the penalties are so draconian, and the, particularly the penalty for going to trial and trying to prove your innocence is so high that if you are offered a plea bargain to a relatively low level crime by comparison, you're gonna take that uh, plea because it greatly reduces your risk. So if, for example, uh, you're in a drug case um, and you're facing a mandatory minimum of 20 years because you were part of, albeit a small part of, a big conspiracy where the total weight of the drugs was many kilograms and that's what drives the guidelines, uh, but also there would be mandatory minimums, uh, so the judge couldn't even have any discretion. And your attorney says to you, you know, you're innocent, you've told me you're innocent, I have I think, evidence you're innocent, um, but the prosecutor says, um, he thinks you're guilty of course, but he'll, he agrees you were a low level type, he'll let you plead to a much reduced charge that will carry only five years mandatory minimum and a guidelines of only five to six years. Um, and an awful lot of people are gonna take that because they don't want to take the risk of doing 20 years, even though they are innocent. So there's no doubt that false confessions do exist. Um, and learned hand notwithstanding, <laughs> it's, it's the reality. Uh, how extensive it is remains uh, somewhat problematic.